gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, uh, Eleanor Stump, who is the Robert J. Hendy Professor of Philosophy at St. Louis University, past president of the Society of Christian Philosophers, um, the American Catholic Philosophical Association, the Central Division of the American Philosophical Association, and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Her interests are very wide ranging, but focus uh, principally on the philosophy of religion, on metaphysics, and medieval philosophy. She has been, for some years, a strong advocate of the importance and irreducibli irreducibility sorry, of second-person relatedness, uh, a mode of relation that forms the basis of her theodicy, Wandering in Darkness, Narrative and the Problem of Suffering, published by Oxford University Press in 2010. And that book incorporated her Gifford Lectures um, in 2003, her Wilde Lectures 2006, and her Stuart Lectures at Princeton in 2009. Um, Professor Stump's other books include Boethius uh, De, De Topicus Differentius, uh, The Cambridge Companion to Aquinas, uh, Aquinas' Moral Theory, Essays in Honour of no Norman Kretzmann, and uh, a great volume with a, um, a deceptively short title, uh, Aquinas, in 2003. Um, that, that's the, um, her formal um, biographical um, summary. But besides that, she has nurtured an extraordinary number of students uh, who have gone up through um, the ranks of various um, uh, institutions worldwide. And she acts as almost, almost um, has a very maternal care for those students. And among the Guild of Philosophers in America, it is sometimes said of her that Eleanor loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. <laughs> The title of her talk today is the, the, the Second Personal and the Transmission of Knowledge Through Testimony. Please would you welcome Professor Eleanor Stump. So I'm delighted to be here at this excellent conference. I'm grateful to Andrew Pinsent for inviting me to this conference. It should be said that uh, he is one of the students that uh, I helped to train, but uh, training, training Andrew Pinsent was like nothing else in life, I can tell you. The smartest thing on two legs and good at everything he turns his hand to. So it's a real pleasure to me to see him flourishing here in the Ian Ramsey Center, and I'm very pleased to be here. I'm a philosopher, I'm not a scientist, and uh, I've helped myself to what I know in amateur fashion of the science on the second personal because to me it seems as if it's a wonderful, a wonderful help to many puzzles in philosophy. Today I'm going to talk about a puzzle involving the transmission of knowledge through testimony. It's virtually universally agreed that testimony is able to transmit knowledge. And it's also widely supposed that trust is important for the knowledge transmitting character of testimony. Overtly or tacitly, a testifier can invite trust, and the person who accepts his invitation voluntarily gives him that trust. Somehow, in consequence, knowledge can be transmitted from the one testifying to the one receiving the testimony. For those philosophers who take knowledge as a product of an epistemic virtue, the testimony accepted on trust in this way is a function not only of knowledge, but also of intellectual virtue. But how are these claims supposed to be understood? It is not easy to see why knowledge transmitted through testimony would count as the product of an epistemic virtue in the person who accepts the testimony. If an epistemic virtue is an excellence of intellect, or, as some epistemologists have argued, if knowledge is success through ability, why would the acquisition of knowledge through testimony count as the product of intellectual excellence or as success through ability in a person whose contribution to acquiring that knowledge consists apparently just in accepting the testimony of somebody else? Furthermore, what is it about trust in particular, that contributes to transmitting knowledge through testimony. And for that matter, what is it for one person to give trust to another? 
These are my questions. It's the puzzle I want to start with. And for my purposes, it will help to have a simple example in which one person's giving trust to another is the primary or even the sole basis for the acceptance of the testimony and the consequent acquisition of knowledge. Philosophers sometimes have complicated cases at this point, but I want a simple case. So consider the first act of Verdi's opera La Traviata. It contains a love scene of the kind that's a staple of opera and romantic literature generally. The fact that its romanticism is commonplace is evidence that for very many people, the scene is plausible. And its plausibility, as well as its simplicity, make it useful for my purposes. So here's how that scene goes. In the story of the opera, Violetta is a young, beautiful courtesan. I don't think we, we have any reference for that word courtesan anymore, but I figure you'll understand what, what it is. Anyway, she's a young, beautiful courtesan. She's the talk of her society. And Alfredo has known about her for at least a year and seen her from a distance on occasion. That small connection with her has been enough for him to come to love her deeply. In the love scene at the start of the first act, Violetta and Alfredo meet for the first time, and Alfredo takes the occasion to confess his love for Violetta. She responds with the skepticism born of her life as a courtesan. She laughs at him. She's prepared to believe that a man might want something from her, but not that he might love her, at least not with the kind of love that includes real care for her, which is the kind of love Alfredo is avowing for her. But Alfredo persists in avowing that he loves her in a caring kind of way. Violetta finally asks him, look, are you really serious? And he says to her, I would not deceive you. With that line, he is, in effect, asking for her trust. Now, these two have just met in the story, and Violetta is in no position to evaluate Alfredo's testimony about his love and care for her on the basis of evidence about his character or his past behavior towards her. Furthermore, it's noteworthy that in the story, Violetta's experience as a courtesan makes trust particularly difficult for her. As she explains to Alfredo's father later in the opera, in her view, she has no friends, and she has no family living either. She does have many acquaintances and admirers, but she sees them as without any care for her. And so she's become skeptical about her chances of ever having real love and care from others. In fact, when Alfredo first expresses his love for her, she responds by explaining to him that she's become indifferent to love. In her world, as she describes it to Alfredo, there is no one who cares for her, and she doesn't care that there isn't. The patina of bravado in that defiantly nonchalant attitude is belied at every turn in the story of the opera. It's clear that because Violetta has learned to see other human beings as predatory or disdainful where she's concerned, Violetta rejects as not possible for her a kind of love and care she, in fact, does hunger for. She's hardened against trust. And nonetheless, here's the interesting thing about the story. In response to Alfredo, on the basis of virtually nothing except Alfredo's urging her to trust him, and in the face of the contrary evidence that her experience as a courtesan has given her, Violetta yields to Alfredo's petitioning for her trust. She simply wills to give Alfredo her trust when he asks her for it. Trusting him, she accepts his testimony about himself, and she believes him. As a result, from the point of view of spectators of the opera, it certainly seems that at this point, Violetta comes to know that Alfredo loves her. If we ask those watching the opera whether at that point Violetta knows that Alfredo loves her, virtually everybody would readily maintain that she does. I hammer this point home only in order to say that in my view, it would take a philosopher worried about the transmission of knowledge through testimony to doubt this description of Violetta. The questions about the transmission of knowledge through testimony are all raised here. What is it for Violetta to give her trust to Alfredo? 
Why does Violetta's giving her trust to Alfredo result in the transmission of knowledge through testimony? Or to put the same question in a different way, what's the connection between Violetta's willingness to trust Alfredo, which is a state of will in her, and her knowledge that he loves her, which is a state of intellect in her? Finally, why think that acquired in this way, Violetta's belief in Alfredo's love for her counts as the product of an intellectual virtue in Violetta. Why wouldn't it, for example, simply constitute gullibility on her part? What gives epistemic value to the epistemic state that Violetta comes to be in as a result of receiving testimony from Alfredo? Now here I have a confession to make. I am a medievalist. So often enough, when there's something I don't understand and want to understand, I find something very helpful in medieval philosophy that explains it. So if you could just be patient for a little bit of scholastic philosophy, I promise you it will be useful in the end. So just, <laughs> so, so for reasons that are going to become clear, I'm going to look for help with all these issues to a place where you wouldn't think there could be any help, but there really is, and that's Aquinas' account of faith and the relation of faith to wisdom. In that process, there's also a sequence of events that starts with a state of will and ends with an intellectual virtue. In my view, a certain resolution of the puzzling issues raised in connection with the transmission of knowledge through testimony in fact, underlies the Thomistic account of faith and wisdom. So in what follows, I'm going to give a very short overview of that Thomistic account of faith and wisdom. My purpose is just to show the way in which, on Aquinas' account, interpersonal trust functions to generate and sustain an intellectual virtue. At this point, you may be thinking, I forgot I'm at a conference on the second personal, but no, I do remember. Because next in this paper, I'm going to use some recent scientific research to elucidate what I think are the underpinnings of Aquinas' account of faith and wisdom. And then, taking as my model Aquinas' account understood in light of those scientific findings, I'm going to return to the case of Violetta and Alfredo and the role of trust in the transmission of knowledge through testimony. I'm going to argue that interpreting the case of Violetta on the model of Aquinas' account, understood in the light of this scientific research, gives us really promising answers to those puzzles I started with. OK, so here's the part where you have to be patient, Aquinas on faith and wisdom. According to Aquinas, in faith, the intellect assents to certain propositions about God, but that assent is generated by the will acting on the intellect. That's because the propositions of faith are not sufficient to move the intellect to assent. There's just not enough there to push the intellect to assent. So when the intellect does assent to the propositions of faith, it does so under the causal influence of the will, which is sufficiently moved by considerations having to do with God. Aquinas thinks that what any human person wants as the greatest of goods is his own happiness. And on Aquinas' view, that greatest good is union with God. For a person coming to faith, his will is drawn to God because of the great goodness of union with God. In consequence of the will's desire for that good, the will commands the intellect to ascend to the propositions of faith. When the will is successful in that command to the intellect, the intellect assents and cleaves to the propositions of faith with conviction. In a person who comes to faith, before the generation of faith in him is finished, his intellect considers the goodness of God and union with God, and his will desires it. Because of the will's desire for that goodness, the will moves the intellect, and the intellect assents. That's a general idea. Now, in this case, on Aquinas' view, the will is working with the design plan of the intellect. Because the propositions of faith are, in fact, true, the operations of the will on the intellect help the intellect to truth. 
Furthermore, because these truths are important and have far-reaching epistemic impact on a person's intellect, for Aquinas, faith contributes to the perfection of the intellect. And so faith is an intellectual virtue, although it arises from the action of the will. For my purposes, however, the most important thing about this part of Aquinas' account is that faith results from what is, in effect, on Aquinas' views, an interpersonal interaction between a human person and God, in virtue of the fact that the person coming to faith is attracted to God. That's the first step. And here's the second step. The generation of faith is followed by the next step in the process of faith leading to wisdom. When the intellect of a person, call her Paula, assents to the propositions of faith under the influence of her will's desire for God, the resulting faith brings about a mutual second personal relation between Paula and God. In this relationship, personal interaction characterized by trust in God and openness to God grows in Paula. In consequence, Paula develops what Aquinas calls connaturality with God, or sympathy with God. When Paula's in that condition, Paula's mind is attuned to God's to one degree or another, and so there's a resonance, or as Aquinas says, a sympathy between Paula and God. For Aquinas, this sympathy enables the development of certain dispositions of intellect in Paula. Because she's open to God as she is, she understands things and has insight into things in ways she otherwise would not have. In the mutual relationship between God and Paula, resulting from Paula's faith then, Paula develops certain intellectual dispositions. These dispositions are the real or the most important of the intellectual virtues on Aquinas' view. So as Aquinas sees it in the connaturality resulting from Paula's second personal relation with God, one of the dispositions that develops in Paula is the intellectual virtue of wisdom. That results not from some activity on the part of Paula's intellect. It results from the sympathetic connection between Paula and God. In excellent and insightful ways that result from that connaturality with God, Aquinas says, Paul is going to be disposed to understand what's good in theory and in practice. In this condition, her judgments will harmonize with God's judgment, and that is the intellectual virtue of wisdom for him. So she has an intellectual virtue, but she has it as a result of her sympathy with God rather than as a consequence of the in independent exercise of her intellectual abilities. This intellectual virtue will manifest itself in Paula's intuitively knowing things that she otherwise would not have known by the exercise of reason or things she wouldn't have known as readily or as well. So I want to call your attention to the fact that as I've given you this brief overview, in Aquinas' account, in a person's coming to the intellectual virtue of wisdom, there are two sequences of interacting states of will and intellect in each of which the will exercises a causal influence over the intellect. The first sequence puts a person in a position to form a natural connection with God. The second sequence results in a person's acquiring from God an intellectual disposition for a certain kind of knowledge. In the first sequence, the will's desire for God is sufficient for the will to move the intellect to accept the propositions of faith when the intellect does so, faith is generated, and in consequence, a mutual second personal relationship of trust develops between Paula and God. That's the start of the second sequence. In that second sequence, this relationship brings with it sympathy or connaturality, as Aquinas calls it, between the human person and God, and that connection of sympathy or connaturality in which a person is willing to give trust to God results in wisdom. So that's how those two sequences go. And here I just need to say one point for philosophers in the audience just to ward off evil for me. Although there's controversy over the nature of testimony, one widely accepted suggestion is that testimony requires one person's voluntarily and intentionally conveying to another person information of one sort or another by means that allow the other person to apprehend the information in question. On that notion of testimony, 
God's voluntarily and intentionally sharing some part of his mind with a human person counts as testimony too. So here's the point. On Aquinas' account then, the relationship generated by faith has the effect of transmitting knowledge from God to a human person through testimony in virtue of trust. That's the idea. And by this means, intellectual virtue is generated in that person through a process that begins with an act of will. Okay, we're done with the scholastic philosophy. You can relax. So, so in my view, that account, which I've run through so briefly with you, that account is helpful for thinking about the general problem of the transmission of knowledge through testimony and the role of trust in that transmission. The most suggestive part of Aquinas' account is the notion of sympathy or connaturality and the part played by trust in establishing that sympathy. But I have to say that his account is also undeveloped at this point. For example, it's not clear what mental capacities are involved in establishing and maintaining sympathy between a human person and God, on Aquinas' view. Aquinas' uh, favorite cognitive capacities or rational capacities, intellect and will, aren't sufficient for the task. The sympathy at issue in Aquinas' account has at least a strong resemblance to the kind of empathy currently thought to be an ingredient in some kinds of mind reading. In human beings, mind reading is the knowledge of persons and their mental states, or so it seems to me anyway. Because of recent work in neuroscience and developmental psychology, especially work on the impairments of development among autistic children, research done by uh, some of you here at the conference, and uh, highly influential work in philosophy it is too, so because of that recent work, we now know a lot more than we used to about sim systems that make uh, empathy and mind reading possible. And I don't mean just uh, mechanistic systems. I mean uh, what Peter Hobson has called child in relation to others. In my world, that's a kind of system too. We will be in a better position to understand what Aquinas is trying to say with that account of faith and wisdom if we look more closely at these systems and the interpersonal connections of empathy they make possible. Whatever ties together the different clinical signs of all the degrees of autism syndrome, the most salient feature of the syndrome is an impairment in the cognitive capacities necessary for mind reading. The knowledge which is impaired for an autistic child, however, in my view, cannot be taken as knowledge that something or other is the case. An autistic child can know that a particular macroscopic object is her mother or that the person who is her mother has a certain mental state. But the autistic child can know such things without the peculiar kind of knowledge that comes from mind reading. So for an example, an autistic child might know that his mother is sad, but in virtue of the impairment of autism, he's unlikely to have this knowledge because he knows the sadness of his mother. An autistic child might know that his mother is sad in any number of ways. I mean, he might, for example, have learned as a rule of thumb that a face with tears on it is sad, and he discerns tears on his mother's face, and so he comes to know that his mother is sad. But that's clearly not the same as the child's directly knowing the mental state of his mother. What's impaired in an autistic child's ability to mind read is the capacity for a non-propositional knowledge of persons and their mental states. New research which in neuroscience, which is still, I guess, somewhat controversial in some quarters, but new research has shown, I think, that the capacity for this kind of knowledge of persons is subserved at least in part by what is now called the mirror neuron system. The mirror neuron system makes it possible for one person to have knowledge of the mental states of another when that kind of knowledge shares something of the phenomenology of perception. Like the perception of color, for example, the knowledge of persons in mind reading is direct, intuitive, and hard to translate without remainder into knowledge that, into propositional knowledge. Although, of course, may be very useful as a basis for propositional knowledge of one sort or another. It now looks as if neurons in the mirror neuron system make this sort of mind-reading knowledge possible 
because they fire both when one does some action oneself and also when one sees the same action being performed by someone else. As Sean Gallagher uh, puts it, and he's been influential in these discussions, as Sean Gallagher puts it, mirror neurons constitute an intermodal link between the perception of actions or dynamic expression and the first person intrasubjective sense of one's own capabilities. That's not uh, really perspicuous or entirely precisely clear in my view, but it is uh, helpful in pointing us in the right direction. The point here is easier to appreciate if we think of empathy, which is currently also thought to be a result of the cognitive capacity subserved by the mirror neuron system. One person, Paula, sees an emotion in another person, Jerome, because the mirror neuron system produces in Paula an emotional state like the emotion Jerome is experiencing, but as we like to say, taken offline. And it's hard to say precisely what that's supposed to be, too. But something like this. In empathy with Jerome's suffering physical pain, Paula will feel something of Jerome's pain. But she'll feel it as Jerome's pain, not as her pain. She doesn't actually suffer physical pain herself, but in her empathy with Jerome, the feeling she has is a feeling that is at least like the suffering of physical pain. And in consequence, she knows Jerome's pain. And in general, in mind reading Jerome, Paula will know what it feels like to do the action Jerome's doing, what it feels like to have the intention Jerome has in doing that action, and what it feels like to have the emotion Jerome has while he's doing that action. In all these cases, Paula will know these things in Jerome through having herself something like some simulacrum of the mental state in Jerome. Or put it another way, something of Jerome's mental state will be in Paula, although it's in Paula in a different way from the way it's in Jerome. One uh, neuroscientist, Vittorio Galesi, tries to explain the mind-reading capacities of human beings this way. He's, he thinks of it this way. Research on infants has shown that there's an innate mechanism that allows infants to map observed behavior on the part of others to their own behavior. The action of this mechanism has been called active intermodal mapping because it enables the brain to translate from visually observed behavior to motor information. That is, the visual observation of another's action or facial expression is translated by this system into motor programs that the observer would use if he were doing the same action or making the same facial expression. By this means, the observer feels from the inside what the observed person is doing and is able to run the motor programs needed to do that action with more or less successful mimicry. That's why this mechanism enables, say, a newborn to mimic facial expressions on the part of an adult caretaker. In adult human beings, Galazi argues, uh, a mirror-matching neural mechanism can represent content independently of the self-other distinction. That's a very interesting idea. That is, the mirror neuron system takes incoming data from vision or other perceptual or even non-perceptual sources and processes it in such a way that at least as one step in the processing, the content of what is observed is available to the observer, but from the inside rather than externally. Everybody has got some struggle to try to explain what I just said. Trying to explain this the idea of a system that takes in all kinds of different modalities and turns them into subjectively available interstates. Galese says this, and I think this is also uh, helpful and uh, prompting to intuition. Galese says this, he says, mirror, mirror neurons map this multimodal representation across different spaces inhabited by different actors. These spaces are blended within a unified common intersubjective space, which paradoxically does not segregate any subject. This space is we-centric. The shared intentional space underpinned by the mirror matching mechanism is not meant to distinguish the agent from the observer. As organisms, we are equipped with plenty of systems from proprioception 
to the expectancy created by the inception of any activity that are able to distinguish the self from other. But the shared space instantiated by mirror neurons blends the interacting individuals within a shared implicit semantic content. So what I want to say about this stuff is it's suggestive, it's powerful. I don't think we understand it as clearly as we need to, but I do think it's very helpful. And I also, for many things in philosophy, and especially for this issue of transmission of knowledge through testimony. And now, uh, because I'm not a scientist, I want to do what philosophers like to do. I want to take a flyer and make a suggestion uh, that goes out ahead of the empirical evidence. I have to say that the last time I did that, I said that just as a vision can be used, uh, just as the visual parts of the brain can be used online or offline in imagination, maybe the mirror neuron system could be used offline also in the appropriation of fiction. And I uh, had that written and published only to discover that somewhere in between when I thought of it and it appeared in print, somebody had actually done that research. And that was exactly right. That was exactly right. Anyway, this is a fly or two. So with this very brief explanation of that recent research on mind reading and empathy, I just need one more thing to connect empathic mind reading with the Thomistic idea of connaturality or sympathy in that sequence going from faith to wisdom. Empathy is most frequently thought of as the ability to feel another person's emotion, especially when that emotion is pain of one sort or another. But I would say that lived experience strongly suggests that the empathic mind reading capacities are capable of a more far-reaching interpersonal connection that can be responsive even to moral characteristics of another person. It's evident, to me at any rate, it's evident that when a person, Jerome, is engaged in doing an action that's morally repulsive, and Paula mind reads Jerome as he acts, then Paula's mind reading of a Jerome will connect her also to the moral characteristics of Jerome as he acts. Graphic videos showing one person's violently abusing another person prompt mind reading in the viewer too, and the mirror neuron system gives the viewer some no doubt limited awareness of the moral state of the abuser, some sense of what it feels like to do morally reprehensible things. That awareness can be troubling when the things in question are highly revulsive to one's sensibilities. Mind reading of someone engaged in serious evil is as disturbing as it is because the mind reader feels at the same time the morally deplorable mental states of the other and her own distress at such mental states. In viewing Jerome's evil acts or evil thoughts and feelings, Paula is going to gain something like a simulacrum of Jerome's evil state, even while she lacks those states of intellect and will that enable Jerome actually to do those evil things. That there is mind reading of this kind, too, is one explanation of why watching graphic scenes depicting evil acts or evil people is so upsetting to most viewers. By the same token, however, it's also possible to suppose that one person can mind read goodness in another person. We recognize directly and intuitively some acts of generosity, of self-sacrifice, of love, of compassion, of kindness, without needing to reflect much or reason out the moral characteristics of what we're seeing. So it seems that the empathic capacities of the mind reading system can give some intuitive knowledge of the moral state of a person and the moral character of an observed act of his. It can discern evil with pain, and it can also intuit moral goodness through actual second personal connection with another person or even through stories. And that's what I need to flesh out a part of Aquinas' account. Aquinas' account of the way in which faith leads to wisdom relies in two places on such an empathic, intuitive recognition of goodness. One gained through stories and descriptions of God, and the other exercised, as he sees it, in second personal experience with God. 
In the first of these two places, a person, Jerome, begins by having some feel for the goodness of God as he learns about it in stories or descriptions, and he has a desire for that goodness. In that empathic state with a God who is still a narrative character for Jerome, Jerome may be willing to assent to the propositions of faith. That is, his will, drawn by an empathic feel for the goodness of God in the stories, may move his intellect to assent to the claim that God exists and is good, as well as the other propositions of faith. And if his intellect does assent, then on Aquinas' account, Jerome will be open to actual second personal experience with God. In the trust generated through that experience, real mind reading will be established between Jerome and God. And then, in consequence of that second personal experience of God and the openness to God it brings, Jerome will be even more empathically connected to God. In that trusting personal connection, Jerome is going to have what Aquinas calls sympathy or connaturality with God. In empathic mind reading, Jerome will share, on Aquinas' view, some no doubt very limited part of the mind of God, and when he does, he will come to know things he apprehends in the mind of God. So on Aquinas' account of faith and wisdom, knowledge is transmitted from God to Jerome through testimony in consequence of trust. Jerome's trust in God's goodness, which Jerome discerns first in coming to faith and then in connaturality with God, that's the basis for the transmission of knowledge through trust from God's mind to Jerome's. What the scientific research on mind reading adds to Aquinas' account is the introduction of a new cognitive capacity or a new set of cognitive capacities which are not part of Aquinas' philosophical psychology, which he never thought about, namely those capacities used in mind reading. The postulation of the cognitive capacities of mind reading is in fact crucial for explaining the transmission of knowledge through testimony on Aquinas' account of faith and wisdom. Insofar as the cognitive capacities for mind reading, like other human cognitive capacities, are basically reliable, even if fallible, then the operation of these cognitive capacities can result in knowledge on any epistemological theory that privileges the reliability of cognitive capacities in its account of the nature of knowledge. And so, although on Aquinas' account of faith and wisdom, in the process of acquiring knowledge in this sequence leading from faith to wisdom, in that process, a person bypasses the usual operations of the intellect, acquiring evidence, assessing reason, so on and so on. Nonetheless, the operation of the will on the intellect nonetheless results in knowledge. And why? Because it depends, the process depends on the mind reading capacity, which is itself as reliable as any other human cognitive capacity and which, in this case, connects a person, in Aquinas' case, connects a person with a highly re reliable source of information, that is, the mind of God. So that's the basic background machinery. With that machinery, now come back to the ordinary, non-theological case of Violetta and Alfredo. How does this case look now with that background? Well, like this. Illuminated by recent research on the mind reading capacities, Aquinas' account of faith and wisdom offers a very promising way to think about the case, the ordinary case, of Violetta and Alfredo. If we explain Violetta's case on analogy to Aquinas' story about a person's coming to faith and wisdom, then the sequence of events regarding Violetta and Alfredo looks like this. That's what it looks like. Violetta begins with a certain resistance to trust in Alfredo and a certain skepticism about the veracity of his testimony to her that he loves her. But as Violetta is face to face with Alfredo, she has some second person experience of him. In this experience, her mind reading capacities give her some limited empathic mind reading awareness of Alfredo. And the result on her part is some small empathic feeling for Alfredo's goodness, at least relative to a limited context 
which includes her especially. Although Violetta does not have propositional evidence sufficient to support the claim that at least where she's concerned, Alfredo is good, nonetheless, her mind reading of Alfredo gives her some awareness of that goodness in him and some desire for it. So just to make the point, this stage in Violetta's case is thus analogous to the stage in the process of Aquinas' account right before a person's acquisition of faith. Next step, next step. In the grip of a desire for that goodness in Alfredo, which is directed towards her, Violetta's will moves her intellect to assent to the belief that with regard to her, Alfredo is good. That belief may be tacit or below the level of conscious awareness. Nothing requires that any of this be fully conscious. So that's what happens next. And that stage in Violetta's case is analogous to the stage in Aquinas' account where a person has come to faith. Then, when Violetta's intellect, moved by her will, has assented to the belief that Alfredo is good, Violetta lets go of some of her previous resistance to trust in him. In consequence, in consequence, there's a deepening of her second personal experience of him. She becomes more trusting of him and so more open to him. In this voluntarily accepted condition of increased receptivity, her empathic mind-reading capacities also become more attuned to him. And the result is an increased and deepened empathic connection to Alfredo. That's like the stage in Aquinas' account where a person acquires connaturality with God. In this condition, the output of Violetta's mind-reading capacity gives her now empathic awareness of Alfredo's love for her. And here, too, she does not have propositional evidence sufficient to support the claim that Alfredo loves her. Nonetheless, when she hears him express again his love for her, this time she believes him, because in the intersubjective space of the mind-reading capacity, she feels his love for her. And so she comes to believe Alfredo loves her. That belief is the result of a reliable cognitive capacity, at least it's, uh, no reason for thinking it any less reliable than uh, intellect or perception. That reliable cognitive capacity, the mind-reading capacity, is employed in the circumstances in which it's designed to be employed in a context in which there are no undefeated defeaters, and so on, as a, uh, philosophers explain uh, reliable accounts of knowledge. And so since those accounts for knowledge are met, when Violetta accepts the belief that Alfredo loves her, she has the knowledge that Alfredo loves her. And at that point, knowledge has been transmitted through testimony from Alfredo to Violetta, at least in part by means of Violetta's mind reading of Alfredo in the trusting second personal relationship established immediately before through the use of her mind reading capacity. So here's the moral of the story. This is the way the ordinary non-theological case of Violetta and Alfredo looks when it's interpreted on the model of Aquinas' account of the generation of wisdom through faith. And seen in this way, Violetta's case gives suggestive answers to the questions I started with. What is it for Violetta to give Alfredo her trust? What is it about Violetta's giving Alfredo her trust that contributes to her acquiring knowledge through testimony? And why would the knowledge that Alfredo loves her, which Violetta acquires on the basis of Alfredo's testimony, why would that count as the product of an intellectual virtue in Violetta or as success through ability in Violetta? Those are the questions. Well. On the model of Aquinas' account, developed in light of recent scientific research, Violetta's giving Alfredo her trust consists in a sequence of events in which the interaction of will and intellect are mediated by the mind-reading system and result in a belief on Violetta's part that Alfredo is good, at least where she's concerned. And the second iteration of the similar sequence mediated by a deeper mind reading, 
results in a belief on Violetta's part that Alfredo loves her. And so we now have a suggestive and promising answer to the first question I asked. The interaction of will and intellect shows the role of the will in Violetta's belief forming process. And the empathic mind reading capacities help to explain why, even with this role for the will, the process can yield knowledge. The mind reading system is a cognitive capacity that looks as reliable as any other, and the beliefs grounded in, in its exercise are as likely to be true as beliefs grounded in perceptual faculties, which are also generally reliable, if not infallible. Furthermore, as the analysis of Violetta's case makes clear, trust is an essential element in the transmission of knowledge through testimony because trust is required for the exercise of the empathic mind reading capacities, which give the grounding for Violetta's coming to know that Alfredo loves her. And so the second question also has an interesting answer here. But in my view, the most philosophically interesting result of this exercise is the answer that the application of the combination of scientific research and uh, 13th century philosophy gives to that third question. What's puzzling, at least initially, about the transmission of intellectual excellence through testimony has to do with the fact that in acquiring knowledge through testimony, a person such as Violetta is doing, apparently, no intellectual work of her own. She just sits there and gets the testimony. We are inclined to suppose that the acquisition of an intellectual virtue or the achievement of success through ability requires some work. We're, we're Aristotelians or Pelagians or something. We think it takes some work on the part of the possessor of that excellence or success. But when Violetta acquires knowledge through testimony from Alfredo, it seems that all the work or all the success from ability is on Alfredo's part. And Violetta just receives the information from Alfredo. So it's hard to see any success or intellectual virtue in Violetta when she gets knowledge through testimony. But recent research on mind reading calls in question the standard philosophical, highly individualistic understanding of knowledge. That's the most interesting moral of the story. On the contrary, this scientific research shows that there are cognitive, <coughs> cognitive systems, which are, as Galese says, we-centric. We center. Because human beings are a social species, some human cognitive capacities are designed to operate excellently only in second personal communion with another person. The mind reading cognitive system is a cognitive system like that. When it operates successfully or excellently, it does so precisely because it manages to connect two disparate minds into some kind of unity. And that unity then provides the basis for the transmission of knowledge. Nonetheless, the intellectual excellence in Violetta is really hers, not because she worked hard in individualistic ways to examine evidence or assess reasons with regard to whether or not Alfredo loves her. Rather, the knowledge that Violetta gets from Alfredo's testimony results in part from the successful exercise of the mind-reading cognitive capacity in her which connects her to Alfredo in knowledge-transmitting ways. This is a social cognitive expertise in the sense that Violetta can't exercise it individually on her own without Alfredo. But it is nonetheless Violetta's excellence. If she were impaired in this capacity, she wouldn't succeed in gaining knowledge through testimony by means of trust. The knowledge that results from her mind reading of Alfredo is therefore a success through ability on Violetta's part. So here's the conclusion. We can understand Violetta's belief that Alfredo loves her as knowledge acquired through testimony because it is a kind of success through ability even though the cognitive capacity being used successfully is the mind reading cognitive capacity which can be exercised only in second personal interaction with another person. Now, of course, the case of Violetta is special, and it leaves many questions unanswered. Much more needs to be said to see how, or even whether, to apply this kind of account to other cases of knowledge transmitted through testimony. Still, 
The example of Violetta is paradigmatic in its simplicity and plausibility, and so an understanding of it is suggestive for further reflection on other cases. In my view, for cases sufficiently like this paradigmatic example of second personal relationship where we apply the neurobiologically interpreted Thomistic model, we get helpful answers to some of the perplexing puzzles that bedevil philosophers about the transmission of knowledge through testimony. And I'm done. Thank you. We now have uh, up to half an hour for, for, for questions. I uh, see quite a few questions already. I think the lady at the back first. And if you'd just like to wait until the microphone reaches you, um, thank you. Thank you very much for your paper. I just wanted to ask about this um, notion of mind reading empathy. And um, I, I just wanted to question how much it is a, a reliable source of knowledge. Um, and obviously, I'm not coming from the perspective of looking at the science or Aquinas, but I'm looking more at this question from the perspective of Gaudamerian hermeneutics where Gautamer, dis, he expresses a certain skepticism that empathy can actually um, lead to substantive knowledge. What it ends up leading to, in his view, is a kind of um, subjectivizing of the other, right? So in this I-thou relationship, it means that in some kind of empathetic relation, I tend to look at you as I see myself, so I impose myself on the other. So I was just wondering if, um, if that is a, a danger in the kind of mind-reading empathetic model that you're saying as a reliable source of, of knowledge? Well, I take as a basic principle that there is nothing whatsoever that human beings can't screw up. And I take as a second basic principle that human cognitive capacities are all fallible. There is no magic formula of the sort some philosophers have looked for that can guarantee you that the result you come up with is a, a true result. So it's certainly the case. Uh, it's certainly the case that the exercise of mind reading can lead to any number of epistemically bad things or even morally bad things. That's that seems to me clearly right. But from as I said yesterday in the Q and A, from the fact that uh, a cognitive capacity is fallible or can give bad results, it doesn't follow it isn't reliable. In fact, you might say. If it weren't reliable, you could never discern that it was fallible. I mean, how would you know that something is an optical illusion if there weren't some cases where your visual system was reliable and you could test the illusion against the reliability? See? In the same way, how would you know that mind reading sometimes gave you a false result or an immoral result if there weren't any way of testing the mind reading, and how would you test it except by some other use of the mind reading system? So you, you think the other guy has a certain uh, mental attitude, and you worry you may have read him wrong, so you ask him, hey, did I get you right? And he says, yes, you did. Now guess what? You have to discern whether or not he's lying. And if you can't tell whether or not he's lying, you have no test for, for whether or not your mind reading capacities were fallible in that case. So that's what I'm saying. These cognitive capacities, whatever they may be, are fallible for sure and certain. But we take their reliability for granted. We have to. We don't have any other choice. First of all, is my voice is not great, so you have to excuse me if my voice is not great. Sorry about that. The first thing I want to say is I want to thank you very much for your paper, excellent paper. I might go back to Augustine, though. Augustine, in that little phrase, 
great about intelligence. I believe in order to understand 15 years of hard work on this issue himself. Extraordinary philosopher of the will, Augustine, wasn't he? Extraordinary philosopher of the will, Augustine. I believe in order to understand. But anyway, in respect of that, I read this, I read totally this host of your paper. Although I do suggest that it's irrelevant today because your paper will be utterly unacceptable in many, 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 many places. Those who make it think between the public, public word of observable evidence, the private word of faith, faith, you know, the private little word of you know, one's own little bubble, one lives in one's own bubble of faith, trust, faith, trust, basic, no, no, no good truth on evidence. There's no good in there to read the public word of evidence. That's the word which you live in today, scientific evidence. Okay. In your paper is irrelevant in that sense. You know, I am so sad to say I could not discern what you were saying. It seemed so interesting and so wonderful, and between the microphone and everything else, I just couldn't make it out. So I may have to have this uh, privately in the... Okay, yes, let me in, just, in just the, leave that for afterwards, because I think it's very hard to be heard here, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I think the gentleman at the, at the back there, and then the lady there, yes, with the, with the, um, with the light blue shirt. Thank you very much. Um, to continue the discussion of reliability, I'm, I'm very much with you and in sympathy. Um, um, and one of the, I, but I suppose my, my reservation is, while I completely agree on mind reading as, as you identify it, um, is reliable, I think it has a lower starting threshold of reliability than some of the other senses or cognitive faculties that one might want to start with. So yes, by and large, we are incredibly good and there's loads of plenty of empirical evidence to indicate where, how good we are at subtle readings of cues and emotions in this, in a dynamic and interact. Absolutely. So at a, at, one might think of this in terms of um, granularity. At a, at, a, at a rough level, we're very good. We can tell whether somebody's sad or angry or whatever it is, particularly in the moment. But there's also, it seems to me, an awful lot of evidence about how we can systematically get this wrong. And I, it's important that it's systematically getting it wrong and not just you know, occasionally getting it wrong. So I would be more inclined towards thinking about mind reading um, as a capacity that we have that if we want to make it more reliable, we have to do quite a bit of work and possibly work on ourselves as well. And now, all sorts of perceptual systems allow for the development of expertise wine tasting, bird recognition, choose whatever your favorite thing. So this is an area where I think that, that that's particularly relevant, that maybe there's, there's the reliability of, of, of our mind reading capacities, other people's emotions, does involve all kinds of um, you know, developments in that. So, so I'd be interested to know what you think would be some of the most interesting or central things to focus on when we're talking about the development of increased reliability in understanding other people's states of mind or in understanding in more detail or in understanding states of mind of people who are more different from us, different cultural backgrounds, these kinds of things. So um, I agree completely that our cognitive capacities can be trained. So if you first take horseback riding lessons, the instructor will say to you, you're on the wrong lead, you're on the wrong lead. The lead is the foot the horse puts down first. And if you have a cantering horse, good luck figuring out which foot is supposed to count as going down first. They're all in motion all the time. So the instructor says, you're on the wrong lead, and you say to her, uh, how can you tell? She says, well, just look at it. You know? And eventually, you will be able to see just looking at it. And how you come to see that is hard to know. It's the same thing uh, for many different areas, as you point out. So some people, they hear Ludoslavsky's cello concerto, and they hear nothing but dissonant noise that makes them want to run away. And other people are deeply moved by uh, that particular <coughs> piece of music. So you can certainly train these things. You certainly can train these things. Uh, I would also like to say, however, that the claim that the faculties are reliable is a limited claim. 
and I just hinted at the limitations on it in that very last part. They are reliable when they are used as they were designed to be used in uh, an environment in which they were designed to be used when there are no undefeated, defeated, and so on. So uh, epistemology has taught us to be very careful in spelling out what we mean by reliable in these cases. So if you put a, a mind-reading person in a condition which is analogous to conditions of optical illusion, then of course you're going to get skewed results. That's how it's going to work. So uh, having said that, however, I think um, what is of interest to me is the recent, is the recent evidence which suggests that the uh, brain systems used for mind reading are also used in the appropriation of narrative. So that um, on the uh, use it or lose it principle, you can suppose that people who never tell each other stories or never read stories, or people whose story reading is limited to harlequin romances, are going to be correspondingly dulled and blunted in their exercise of these capacities. People who exercise the capacities through uh, significant social interaction and through appropriation interaction with the world's great literature are going to be correspondingly better. And of course, it should be said <coughs> that in this as in everything else, there, there are native gifts. Some people are just born better at some stuff than other people. There's that too. Concerning one of your conclusions where you claim that the, your example, which is a confession of love, was one of, was, the, was a very paradigmatic example of a transmission of knowledge by testimony. And I wondered about that because testimony, at least as I understood it, was, could be about anything. So I could testify that the sun was shining yesterday or something like that. Confessions, by contrast, are, ver are, are, are a very particular case of testimony because they concern myself. Oh, yeah. I and confess that, my love or my fear. Yeah, yeah. And in that sense, I think they are different because they invite the other person not just to trust me, rather they invite her to take a standing upon what I said. They, they change the relationship between the p two persons in a, not just in an epistemic way that I was the person who testifies and the other has to trust me, rather I mean, I confess something, and it changes the relationship in a much deeper way, it seems to me. It's completely true. In the long version, this is a short version of a paper that's going to appear in a collection um, on the subject, but in the long version, I lay out many ways in which the case of Alfredo and Violetta is uh, special. But sometimes you have to start with a special case in its simplicity to, to begin to make some progress on a puzzle which otherwise seems very hard to make any headway with. But it is certainly true. The question, um, I mean, I would translate your question like this. Is there any reason for thinking that a case like this generalizes? I mean, suppose I'm giving you a physics lecture rather than telling you I love you. And now you've got uh, my testifying to claims about physics. Yeah. Is there any way in which the case of Violetta and Alfredo will help you here? Um, it, it seems as if it couldn't possibly, and yet, you know, I think, I think it will. And uh, here's why. So this is not my idea. I have, to, um, I have to give credit where credit is due. I gave a paper on this subject at a different conference where there was a physicist from a very famous physics lab. And he was very excited about this stuff. He said it actually helps explain how things work in physics. He said, how does knowledge get transmitted through testimony in physics? He said, because in the entire process of peer review, job acquisition, fellowship getting, grant getting, and so on, all these places, somewhere along the way, the community or the grant giving body or whatever the relevant group may be, gets an idea whether the person in question has got a certain kind of basic human decency about them. 
There's an, an, an evaluation of the goodness in that other person. And on that basis, people are more or less willing to give trust. On the basis of that trust, then other things happen which might not happen without the trust. So I'm just saying it is for sure a very special case that it would be hasty to think you couldn't generalize from it. I think it was Ray next. Thank you for a very bold and, and suggestive talk. I mean, anybody gets St. Jerome, Violetta, and uh, Aquinas all in the same room is, you know, gets my vote. <laughs> but I just want to sound a note of caution about your use of neuroscience, and in particular the uh, mirror neurons, to explain, for example, Jerome's mind reading God or Violetta's kindly, uh, finally coming to understand that Alfredo does truly love her. To go back to the science, mirror neurons were first described in macaque monkeys. And their job was basically to replicate uh, the movement or, or the neural activity associated with movement in monkeys observing those movements. Very simple mirroring of movement to movement in an organism that is rather different from ourselves. They subsequently been demonstrated in even humbler creatures, such as swamp birds and so on, who don't make the kinds of judgments that Jerome and Violetta would be having to make. And I think the problem is that mirroring is a very poor metaphor really for the sort of judgments that we do make. When Violetta gradually comes to understand that Alfredo does love her, she would have picked up a whole load of clues and gossip and you know, conversation around the place over a very long period of time. And likewise, I'm sure Jerome's uh, mind reading God would have been greatly influenced by some of the theological background. So whereas Mirror neurons may explain some aspects of emotional contagion in some creatures, and it may explain some of the ways in which we possibly imitate people slightly unconsciously. I think they have little to do with the very complex narratives of everyday life. And a further note of caution, there is still some controversy as to the status of the mirror neuron system in human beings. It's well established in beasts, other beasts than us. So I think there's quite a lot of vulnerability to a thesis that places mirror neurons at the center of um, our, our trusting testimony. Well, let me say at the outset that I have no license to pronounce on neuroscience. I'm a philosopher. So like any other uh, philosopher interested in irrelevant science, I read eclectically, erratically, and I'm an autodidact. I have to say that although um, I would be happy to uh, back off from any neuroscience claim I make. It does seem to me, nonetheless, that there is a mountain of evidence and many people persuaded of the truth of the things I said about neuro mirror neurons. Now, they might all be wrong, but they're, they're out there. They're out there. So um, I guess the, that's the first thing I want to say. It does seem to me that the evidence for mirror neuron system in humans is uh, by now powerful. Maybe that wasn't true in the 1990s, but by now it, I think it is. I wasn't it, suggesting there wasn't evidence of mirror neurons yeah, in humans, but the actual status and how they relate to the kind of complex activities yeah, we yeah, engage yeah. in. Yeah. yeah, so the second thing I want to say is I was careful at every point to say that the mind reading capacities are subserved at, in part by the mirror neuron system. God knows what else comes into the picture. In the second place, n nothing I said suggests that this system gives a result in total, uh, what do I want to say, in total isolation from surrounding context, nothing we do does that. I mean, if your visual system weren't trained through a long process that begins uh, when you're born, you couldn't see a cup either. So no system really works in isolation. These systems work in tandem with uh, very many other things in your brain. So uh, that's the second thing I want to say. And the third thing I want to say is what is uh, clear to me at any rate and very important to be clear about is that you can have, uh, you can have many levels. I don't know if that's the right way to put it. Many levels by, by which a cognitive capacity is exercised. So... Uh, Take the, capacity, take the visual capacity. You look, you see the coffee cup. One instantaneous exercise of one cognitive capacity. 
But actually, you know, you've got a brain system for processing orientation in space, one for processing motion, you've got processing for color, you've got processing for recognizing what my medievals would call the quinest of the thing, the proximate species of the thing. You had all these different systems and you can knock them out selectively. So when you have a sense of one cognitive capacity, the visual capacity, I mean, that's your phenomenological sense, but the machinery is very different. In the same way, and so you, you, can, have, you can have levels, even for vision, as the examples, or for hearing, as the examples I just gave show. There's a kind of natural ability to hear that uh, a baby has when it's born, if its auditory system is functioning properly. There's the kind of hearing you you and that you will have in common with, say, I don't know, songbirds. Then there's the kind of hearing you've got when you hear the Ludoslavsky cello concerto. That's a very different kind of hearing, see? So for mind reading, it's going to be like that, too. <coughs> for empathy, it's going to be like that. So there is a level of empathy, which you might say is very low level. I watch you plant your bare foot on a nail in the garden, and I, I wince. That's an involuntary connection to your pain. Uh, then there's the empathy I have for Alyosha in the Brothers Karamazov when he seems up against it and sad. That's a very different kind of empathy. And in between, no doubt, there are many other levels. Many of those upper levels, songbirds are never going to get. So I have no doubt that animals aren't human, as I said in response to your paper. They're not human. They don't have rational capacity. And they can't use what they share with us in the way humans can use it. It's not, they don't have it as a human capacity. But the fact that we find these systems in these other animals doesn't mean that they don't function in an analogous way in us. That's the last thing I want to say. Because <clears throat> Peter Hobson is one of my heroes. So if Peter Hobson says I have it all wrong, I'm going to leave you now and go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> There is no way I would dare, even if I felt that, but I, mm -hmm. I don't. The, two points. Just one is just about the potential hazards of the word, the word cognitive. I'm going back to my earlier talk. When you say the mind reading system is a cognitive system, I take it from your examples that <clears throat> you don't mean cognitive, as some people do, as opposed to affective or motivation. No, that that's, is that's quite, quite right. That, that's quite right. I just need, I need what is in my world a garbage can term. Yeah. And that's the closest I know how to get to it in my world. Okay. Yeah. Now, the second thing is, I, I'm really interested in, in, in what you have to say, and it's really the basis of just hearing you rather than knowing the background, but about where the will comes in and its connection with virtue in relation to the transmission of, of knowledge. Mm. And what you didn't really go into in some detail, but it seems to me it's a very rich area, is if you had this notion of mind reading, or as I would be saying, identifying with the other, Firstly, where the act of will comes in making oneself available to being affected in the appropriate kinds of way, but also the complexities of receiving from another. Mm -hmm. And the issue about virtue in this, you know, all of us turn a blind eye now and again. And actually, it's a more complicated and generous process, I think, to receive from people, whether it's information or other things, with what goes with that, namely an awareness of dependency, Mm -hmm. on the other, of not being the source of all goodness, mm -hmm. of having to deal with one's own envy. So mm -hmm. in fact, there are a number of virtues that come into mm -hmm. the process of being able to be in a position both to identify with others and to receive what they offer, mm -hmm. which may be closely connected with virtue and what that means for intellectual, the acquisition of knowledge and intellectual development. No, I think that's completely right. And elsewhere, I've worked at these issues in enormous detail, talking about what it is for one person to be close to another, what kinds of things get in the way of that kind of closeness, how those things that ward off other people are connected to the absence of moral virtue in us. So I think that's completely right. I, I, um, I take note of the fact that your tribe is interested in this issue of will in a very different way because um, somebody in your community has said somewhere in that lovely book produced by Naomi uh, Island and some of the rest of you here, that lovely book, somebody has said, it's not that autistic children can't do this, this mind reading, interactive, engaging sort of thing, but that they put a lot of energy into warding it off because they don't want it. 
And I've never seen anybody really pursue that idea, but it does seem to me, uh, what do I want to say? It does seem to me an idea which, uh, for me anyway, is got some mild confirmation from my own experience with autistic children. So, for example, um, I held a little autistic baby, a baby with institutional autism, up in front of my face to make eye contact, and the baby refused it. So I forced the issue. I held the little baby's face like this in front of mine, and the little baby outwitted me by doing this. No eye contact for you. So, so um, it seems to me a uh, not so much explored issue in your part of the world, but, but interesting to think about. So I'm just briefly with two words. One about the autism picture. Uh, my concern about that is if you go so far down the line about withdrawal, mm -hmm. they aren't incompatible. That is to say, there may be processing difficulties that precipitate then as a secondary effect uh -huh. Uh -huh. modes of withdrawal. That's in uh -huh. fact what I think happens. Uh -huh. It's not an either or. But, uh -huh. the, but the, the, the second thing is, the neck of the woods you might be talking about, you know, autism is one, but other forms of psychopathology where blotting out uh, things that need to be addressed, including receiving from others, may be a very important factor in the development of uh, other kinds of difficulties beyond autism. So I think it's wide-ranging implications for psychopathology in other domains, like narcissism, for instance. Well, like, or, or what about uh, sociopathic individuals? Are they an example you were thinking of? Okay. okay. Uh, His stuff is so interesting, you never want to quit. <laughs> uh, we'll probably manage about one or two more questions, but what I do encourage you um, is to, if you've got any other questions, you either, either to raise them privately with Professor Stum, or else um, we're going to have a final panel discussion. She will be staying till the last day, um, so there'll be an opportunity for a lot more questions uh, at, towards the end of the conference. I think it was Stephen next. So this follows on the second part of what Peter's uh, remarks and questions. Um, <coughs> there's really interesting questions about the, the role of the will, um, and let's just grant that uh, the will is in there somewhere. Um, but I'm wondering if there isn't sort of an underlying n involuntary or non-voluntary responsiveness to others that one can either willingly engage or not, or to dial up or dial down. Uh, and. So I was interested in the Aquinas analogy. I guess there, there are two points where the will comes in there. Right. First is moved by a desire for a certain good, I then assent to certain propositions, I guess, or I, right. right. And the second part is much more genuinely second personal. Right. Once I've got myself convinced that there is a person there uh, and I start to relate to that person, then via the mechanisms you're talking about, I can have a second personal experience of God's goodness, and so can then. Yeah, yeah, but the first part is second personal, too, because oh, in yeah. ways that I didn't bring out clearly enough because yeah. I had to cut so much out of this paper, yeah, yeah. the first stage is generally a matter of a person's being responsive to, you might say, the narrative character of God in stories and descriptions about God. See? Uh -huh. So it's got that kind, it's got the same kind of second personal character that, uh, you would, you would be having, in case you said about Trollope's character, the Duchess, the yeah. Dutch, I know the Duchess of Omnium, she'd never do a thing like that. Yeah. Well, so just one, one last thing. So okay. it seems to me it's, there's an important difference between becoming convinced of certain things about God, let's right. say, either because of stories or because of whatever, mm -hmm. and, and responding to what one takes to be a call from God, let's well, say, right. being in... So, this is sort of going back to what Peter was saying, the Buberian idea, the relation is what's primary, mm -hmm. right? Um, so if we're starting with something second personal, then it's going to be second personal all the way, and there's not yeah. going to be a desire for some good that's going to get you into that relation. Right, right. It's, you've got to be in the relation. And so, so when you say, for example, about Violetta and Alfredo, in the grip of a desire for that goodness in Alfredo, which is directed towards her, Violetta's will moves her intellect to assent to the belief that with regard to her, Alfredo is good. 
I thought that ran against what you were saying yourself about how in a certain second, when you're in a second personal relationship to someone, you can experience their goodness. I was just trying yeah. to say, uh, there's two, two things here. I want to be careful to separate them. In the case of uh, Aquinas in that first sequence, yeah. because I wasn't careful enough to highlight it, you're missing some of the second personal character of his account. His idea is that in desiring this goodness, it's not that you're making some kind of utilitarian calculation or Pascaline wager. It's that you get to know God through story. And something about him, as presented in the story, prompts in you a yearning for him. And that's what starts the process. The goodness is the goodness of a person that, it, that you want. So there is second personal stuff in that first stage. But uh, in the case of uh, Violetta, um, I want to distinguish between her awareness of Alfredo's goodness, where she's concerned, and her belief that Alfredo is good. And I want to say there is a kind of uh, sequence there, awareness followed by propositional belief, where the propositional belief is not, you might say, unwarranted or unjustified because it's based on the awareness. And finally, uh, for the first part of uh, your comment, where you said there's something uh, about some of these capacities that's involuntary, that I grant wholly. That's what I said in uh, response to Ray. These things are many uh, leveled. So there's going to be a kind of low level something or other, which you, you do involuntarily and immediately, just as if someone shoots a pistol out there, you will hear it, whether you want to or not. On the other hand, if you're sitting in church listening to a very boring sermon, you can tune the whole thing out and not hear it at all. And that's a case of wills uh, having an impact even on a perceptual capacity. See, it's all like that. Thanks very much uh, for the whole conversation. Um, this has somewhat been addressed indirectly already in the questions. Um, you wanted to talk, uh, suggest empathic interaction can include moral characteristics or capacities, something like that along those lines, and talked about um, observing someone abusing another person and, and mind reading the state of the abuser and the state of perhaps of the abused. And So my question is, um, and why we're upset as we see that, but the question is, what is it that makes one person um, really upset and appalled and another person attracted by the violence? Um, it, because violence can be very contagious. Um, and and um, so it's, it's a question of how the moral distinctions happen within that mind reading process. And I think perhaps we've already gotten at some of those answers, but I'd like to hear your reflections. Well, you know, human beings uh, are are complex, and one of the uh, hallmarks of human beings is that they can, uh, they can divide. So you can have in your mind contradictory beliefs, for example. You can have contradictory desires in your will. You can be in the state of Catullus, who said about the woman who was central in his life, I love her and I hate her. Okay, that's a kind of complex emotion, you might say. So, so human beings are capable of all kinds of internal division. And in the case of somebody who um, watches with distress an act of violence to which he is also drawn in some kind of lustful way, you, you have one more instance of the way in which human beings can, uh, can be divided against themselves. What distresses them is also what attracts them. But I would say, in cases of that complicated sort, that what attracts him is the thing he comes to know through the distress. What's attracting him is the, the precisely the evil or the violence or whatever it is, the destructive action against another human being. He wouldn't feel it to be attracted by it if the mind reading capacities didn't first give him a connection to what's bad about it, what's awful about it, something like that. Well, 
And we're going to draw uh, to a close. Um, just to